somewhere around. Welcome. You're listening to Women's Health and Beyond with Dr. David Goslin, the only podcast for women providing a physician's point of view on everything relating to women's health, sexual medicine, and cosmetic gynecology. Get ready to discover the latest and hottest topics in women's health and how they relate to you. Welcome to my podcast. This is Dr. David Goslin. I'm honored today because I have a good friend of mine, Dr. Mark Youssef, who it practices in Santa Monica, California. I have to be honest, he probably has one of the best location and most beautiful offices I've ever been to. It's right on the pier of Santa Monica overlooking the ocean. He's the owner of a unique surgery center and medical spa. He's a graduate from the University of California, Irvine, and he's a diplomat of the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery. On that note, welcome to the show, Dr. Mark Youssef. Thank you, Dr. Goslin. Thanks for having me on your show. Oh, it's always a pleasure. Today, I know you do a lot of very interesting things, but last, last time I saw you, you told me you just finished writing a book called The Art of the Brazilian Butt Lift, and it really caught my attention. I actually read it, and I, I've learned a lot, so I have a lot of questions for you today, but today's focus is really going to be about the BBL and how we got to this point, and all about the procedure, the recovery, and the perfect ideal butt. On that note, is it okay if I call you Mark? Uh, please, please. Mark, tell me a little bit about you, your background, and how you got into cosmetics, and then we'll dive right into the Brazilian butt lift. All right. Well, in a nutshell, um, I actually started my career as an OBGYN, uh, just like you. And as you probably remember, back in the early 2000s, there was a lot of changes in the field. There was... Um, uh, less men going into the field, uh, higher demand for female doctors, uh, malpractice insurances were going up, reimbursements were going down. Um, I was actually going through a really tough divorce at the time as well. And it, everything kind of led me towards making a career shift. And what pushed me the most was um, this kind of artistic fun side of, of, of me that I wasn't able to express as much in traditional medicine. Um, so my creative side uh, kind of pushed me towards going into something where I could use a little bit of my artistic abilities, uh, started learning about cosmetics, went back and did my board certification in cosmetic surgery. And I've really been doing solely cosmetic surgery and medical spa procedures for the past uh, almost 17 years now. I mean, to be honest with you, I don't even think you remember how to do a pap smear. <laughs> I think the last time I delivered a baby was 2004 or five. <laughs> That's great. So Mark, I know today we're going to talk about the very famous Brazilian butt lift. Yeah. So tell me a little bit, how did this trend start? When, when, when did you start seeing this dynamic change towards augmenting butts? Was there a catalyst to it? Was it, was it uh, music that sort of started this? Or was it movie stars that sort of got the ball rolling? Tell me a little bit about it. I think it was, it, it's funny because I started cosmetic surgery in 2004 and you weren't hearing much about it. And then for about four or five, six years later, you started to see both the music industry and celebrities start to dramatically push this subject. So I'm talking about the rap music industry where you started to see songs and, and again- Baby Got Back? Well, that started back in the 90s. So Baby Got Back with Sir mix started in the 90s. But then if, if you look at, even like the, the mid to late 2000s, you've got songs like from Destiny's Child, like Bootylicious, uh, 2003, Salt Shaker, 2004, My Humps, uh, 2005, Shake It. Uh, remember the Flo Rider song from 2008 called Low? Yeah, uh, totally. there, 2012, there was a song called Bubble Butt. And you know, the list goes on and on and on. Miley Cyrus blew up the internet with her song about twerking. Um, there was a song by Jason Derulo called Wiggle. Uh, and then, of course, the famous Megan Trainer in 2014 um, with all about the bass and, and, and promoting uh, more rounder shaped butts, uh, promoting fuller shaped women that weren't those shapes weren't as popular back in the early 2000s or in the 1990s. Um, and then, of course, you have the celebrities like Kim Kardashian, you have the celebrities like Jennifer Lopez, 
Iggy Azalea, Nicki Minaj, Cardi B, uh, all of these in the past five to 10 years have made the Brazilian butt lift one, suddenly one of the most popular cosmetic procedures in the entire country. You know, it's funny because plastic surgery follows a lot of trends, right? And I remember, I mean, you're talking the 90s when big breasts were in. And, and, and now that I'm doing a lot of cosmetic surgery in my practice, even though I, I mostly just stick to the pelvic area, the vaginal area, uh, I remember, you know, Dolly Parton, for example. And, and now we're not seeing that much of that trend, but I'm seeing a ton of women desiring to change the shape of their booty. And, yeah. and, and it's something that, that I thought would be just very transient, but it's really been ongoing for quite some time and it seems to be here for a while. Um, so, you know, it, it's fascinating to me how trends change over time, over decades and what's staying and what's not. Um, but on that note, so how do you know, I mean, is there an ideal butt out there? Is there a criteria that says, hey, you have a great butt, it's perfect proportions, this is the way it should look. What makes an ideal butt? I mean, I always thought it from a scientific standpoint, which, you know, it's all about reproduction and you're looking for the hip width. But yeah. is there something that as a plastic surgeon you look for and advise patients on? There, I wouldn't say there's an actual ideal butt. I would say there's a few overall acceptable ranges of ideal butts. And, and when we say ideal butts, the, the technical things that we measure in, in preoperative or in consultations is something called uh, the hip to waist ratio. So at, as bigger butts become more popular, uh, the hip to waist ratio becomes uh, smaller because the waist becomes a smaller numerator and then the hips become a larger denominator. So if you look at I ideal butts, let's say that on covers of magazines, 15, 20 years ago, you'd see something in the range of maybe point, uh, point 0.7 to point 0.75. And now what you're seeing on TV, in magazines, in music videos, you're seeing something in the range of 0.58 to 0.65. So, so smaller waist, bigger volume in, in the buttocks area. Right, right. And so the wider the hips get, the smaller the waist gets as an illusion as well are really making this hourglass shape more exaggerated or more accentuated, if you want to call it. So that's pretty much what today's society considers an ideal butt. Now, when I was going through your book, you mentioned several different types of butt shapes. Uh, the H shape, the A shape, the heart shape. Mm -hmm. Tell and me a little, and the O shape. Mm -hmm. it, it, tell, tell the audience a little bit about you know, classifications and, and, and how that works in, in your consultations? So when, when, when women come in, they generally have uh, something about their butt that they don't like. It's either too flat or genetically they're very square shaped. Or for example, a lot of women come in and they feel like they're very pear shaped, which means uh, they're very wide in the hips or they have outer thighs or saddlebags. So we kind of take what genetically they're unhappy with. And then we talk about um, their desired shape. So if they want to kind of have more of an A shape or upside down heart shape, you know, that is something we can ideally form by putting a little bit more fat in the lower half of the butt. A lot of women, or I would say the most popular type of butt people ask for is this bubble butt, which everything is round and lifted all the way around. That's the O shape. Um, a lot of women kind of have a little bit more of a boxy square uh, genetic build to them, and they may want something like an H shape, which is pretty much uh, a little bit less round uh, and more uh, rectangular on the edges. And of course, the V shape, which is the upside, uh, which is the right side up heart shape, where a lot of the fats transferred to the upper half of the hips to give the legs a little bit more of a narrower shape. Um, I would say out of most of the patients who come in, um, they prefer uh, the O shape or the upside down heart shape, with, which is the A shape. Um, so, but really when people come in for consultation, I think the biggest thing 
uh, that we talk about is what's realistic and what expectations what are um, acceptable for somebody. Yeah, so it, it, you know, somebody who comes in who's let's say 110 pounds and five foot ten, there's not going to be that much fat we can transfer to start with, and then we have to be very um, realistic on how much we can even change the volume of the buttock. We're not for weight a person is, the more we can kind of manipulate the shape of the butt and, and have more fat to play with, so to speak. So Mark, if it's okay with you, walk me through the consultation, how you counsel a patient in regards to your opinions, um, what's realistic, what's not realistic, um, where do you typically take the fat from? Um, Tell me about the procedure. Is it, is it is it an hour? Is it three hours? Okay. Um, and, and and maybe you can also discuss some of the risks involved with the procedure as well. Yeah, and actually, I think we should leave some time to talk about risk because that's uh, that's been actually one of the most controversial topics, even since I finished the book. Um, but when a patient comes in for a consultation, we start with the basic history and physical exam. We talk about you know, what their past medical history is, what their surgical history is, what medications are on it, and really just try to figure out if there's any contraindications to the, the procedure, um, or if there's any reasons we can't do the procedure. Uh, then we, we really look at a couple of big things like their body mass index, BMI. So most people out there who are weight conscious know that a normal BMI is somewhere around 18.5 to 25. Most adults in the United States are overweight or obese. Um, being overweight is anywhere from about 25 to BMI of 25 to 30, which is actually ideal for this procedure. And then you have um, uh, moderately obese at 25, at uh, 30 to 35, and then over 35, you, you start to become more obese. So uh, unfortunately, as you become more obese, yes, you do have more fat to transfer, but you also have higher risks for surgery. In fact, a lot of anesthesiologists prefer not to even operate on people um, or put people under anesthesia with a BMI over 35. So ideally, we're looking for somebody who's got a BMI between, um, let's say, 28 to 32 is ideal. So that way you have enough fat to transfer and we can achieve the goals that you want, um, and you're healthy enough, not, and your BMI and your overweightness is not so high that you're in a risk for anesthesia. So that's kind of the purpose of the consultation, is to really uh, see what their BMI is, get a realistic shape of where we're going from the before to the after, uh, and make sure that the patient's okay with that amount of change, figure out what shape they want, just like the four shapes that we talked about. Um, and make sure there's no risks for anesthesia. Once when we have that plan, we go ahead and do the surgery. The surgery itself, um, it takes the average, what we call a lipo 360, is basically liposuctioning the torso area all the way around. So that's generally the abdomen and love handle area and generally kind of like the bra line area. Those three areas are where we extract the fat majority of the time. If somebody is pear-shaped, then we will also recommend removing some fat in the outer thighs because that also helps remove the extra frame of fat around the buttocks. Um, sometimes getting an ideal shape butt isn't necessarily what you transfer to the butt, but it's what excess fat you remove from the outside frame of the, of the buttocks and hip. So if someone has a very square shaped buttocks and you just remove fat from the lower love handles and maybe from the outer thighs, that buttocks will naturally look better even before you add any fat into it. So it's sometimes removing the unwanted frame of fat. Um, so that part of the procedure is done. In general, if we're doing just a, a abdomen, love handle, and bra line, uh, liposuction. That takes about two hours and transferring the fat takes about an hour. So the total procedure is about two and a half to three hours to do a typical BBL. And of course, if there are additional unwanted fat areas, it would probably be about three to four hours total. Um, once when they have that procedure, we put them in a garment, they recover for about an hour in our recovery room. And we generally see them uh, the first day after the, the surgery just to make sure there's no excessive bleeding, there's no excessive bruising, that they're healing well. And then we typically see patients at uh, one week to remove any small little uh, stitches from the puncture holes, 
and we see patients at uh, one month, three months, six months, and 12 months. Got and that's it. pretty much in a nutshell. So when, when do they start really noticing a difference? I'm assuming it's not right away, they're swollen. When, when do you start telling them their realistic uh, expectations should be met? The real, the real results aren't really seen for six months, um, but a lot of things change in the first six weeks. And just like you know, with, with uh, pelvic surgery, there's a lot of swelling in the first four to six weeks. But particularly with BBLs, there's not just swelling, but there's also fat cells not surviving uh, the, the transfer. So most doctors agree that you lose about 40 to 50% of the fat that you transfer. So for every, every liter of fat that we transfer to a buttocks, the patient's only going to keep about five to 600 cc's of that 1,000. So some of the swelling is just natural trauma from the surgery, but a lot of the swelling is just ge general fat necrosis and fat liquefaction that the body has to resorb. So most people uh, are gonna look excessively swollen and their butt's gonna look really big for the first one to two months. They're gonna start to notice the, 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 the shape, the final shape at about three months, and then the final swelling is gone by about six months. So I tell people not to really judge it till about the six month. But most people by three months have about 75% of their uh, swelling gone. Now, I didn't realize you lose about 40 to 50% of your fat cells. Um, <clears throat> I know when I do small lipo transfer to the labia majoris for labia puffing, I will oftentimes add PRP to it, platelet-rich plasma. Um, are, you do, are you guys doing that with large amounts of fat transfer or is there any tools that you can use to maybe decrease that percentage or is that something that's just general and you're, 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 you're obviously over um, transferring about 50% just to get to the final end goal you want? I, most doctors, I, I've tried all different types of ways to get more fat to survive. Um, there, there are really complex ways, not just PRP, which we've tried. Some doctors have tried adding um, albumin. There's studies that show that adding albumin to the fat uh, increases the survival. There's some studies that show if you centrifuge and concentrate the fat, uh, it, it slightly increases the survival. Um, a lot of people will try adding stem cells to the fat to try to increase the percentage of survival. And all of these things are very possible, but the majority of people who do this procedure uh, don't feel like it's warranted to you know, make the procedure cost two, three, four times more just to increase the survival, let's say from 50 or 60% up to 70%, you know, right. 10 to 15% increase. It's much e better to overcompensate for it by adding a little bit more fat than to, you know, add 10 or $20,000 of stem cells in or, or PRP. PRP is a lot more reasonable to add in, which a lot of doctors do do. Um, but I don't think the percentage of survival is going to go up dramatically uh, with those, at least not from what I've seen. So, Mark, we know that fat survival is difficult to, to judge while you're doing the procedure. I think that's the big dilemma. And when I counsel patients, when we augment the labia majoris, for example, with fat, I always tell them, look, there's a chance that it may not be as even because you may have a small pocket that loses more fat on one side than the other. And I'm sure the same thing happens in, when you're doing a BBL. Yes. If you do see those changes and the patient is concerned and disappointed with that, how do you rectify that? It's not actually that hard to, to, to rectify. If, if a patient's, let's say, six months out and let's say one butt cheek really takes better than the other um, and there's a significant asymmetry, um, it's not that hard to go in and choose, uh, you know, one more area or an area that has maybe a little bit more fat um, that can be removed. We do a touch-up procedure where we do just a tiny bit more liposuction, and then we just transfer that fat into the smaller buttocks that kind of didn't have as much fat survive. Yes, it is another procedure, and it's probably another round of anesthesia, but uh, it's definitely a fixable problem. In what percentage of patients would you say that happens in? It's very rare. I would say probably less than 10% of patients have to have another procedure. Um, luckily, 
most patients heal fairly symmetrical on both sides. When you're doing large volume, I think in the labia, because it's such a small area, even like more noticeable. Yeah, even five or 10 cc difference is, is more noticeable, but no one would ever perceive a 20 or 30 cc difference in the buttocks. Makes sense, makes sense. So how long does a Brazilian butt lift last? Well, just like everything, David, uh, Brazilian butt lifts uh, don't last uh, forever, just like any other procedure. Um, most, uh, I tell most people about eight to 10 years is a typical fat transfer lifespan. In other words, after eight to 10 years, you start to see the elasticity of the skin kind of um, sagging a little bit. You start to have the loss of collagen. Uh, you do just like just like fat atrophies in our face as we get older every 10 years. So does the buttocks. So um, I think the best results are within the first 10 years. But realistically, because these fat cells uh, create their new blood supply and create a new home for themselves, some of the fat cells will actually last forever. But uh, realistically, the nice result of the, the liftness and the perkiness of the buttocks is probably wears off in about eight to 10 years. Now, are there things during the recovery period that patients should really try to avoid in order to really optimize their results? Yes, 100%. Uh, it's very, very uh, well agreed on that. You know, crushing these newly transferred fat cells in the first month is a bad idea. Uh, sitting on hard surfaces, uh, driving too much, um, uh, you know, um, not... Uh, not eat, not not hydrating, um, not wearing the proper garments. All of these things in the first four weeks can really crush and kill more fat cells than even the the forty or fifty percent that you're going to lose. Um, and then, of course, there's uh, things that you you want to make sure you're not nourishing yourself. A lot of so thin ways that they just like don't want to eat or anything. And the first the first three or four weeks, you want you need, you need to feed these fat cells. You need to make sure that they're they're surviving. So you want so to McDonald's. eat properly. No, not necessarily McDonald's. No, um, but you want to eat a good balanced diet. You don't want to be on like a starvation diet just because you're afraid of you know uh, gaining weight again. It's one of the few times where you do want to eat you know a good amount of healthy calories um, so that you don't uh, starve these these fresh fat cells. And then, of course, uh, maintaining good a good exercise routine, um, gluteal muscles, uh, maintaining the strength of the gluteal muscles, like squats and, and uh, de dead leg lifts, um, anything, walking up and downhill, just to firm up the muscles beneath the fat, because that's what also maintains the lift as well. It's not just the fat, but it's also the gluteal muscles. Oh, that's interesting. Now, let's say I'm pretty skinny. I come and see you and... Really, there's not many areas to liposuction fat from, but I really want to augment the volume of my buttocks. Are there alternative treatments that you can use instead of fat or if you're not able to get enough fat to achieve the desired look in order to give them a much a, a better size buttocks? That's a great question. Yes, there's a few alternatives um, to fat transfer, especially for women who are very thin that don't really have the option of transferring fat. A lot of women who are you know, in that 18 BMI or less really don't have a, a lot of uh, body fat. So there's a few options. Um, probably the least desirable option, and I'll tell you why, is uh, using a buttocks implant. Um, buttock, buttock implants are kind of a solid version of a breast implant. They're more of like a firm silicone that are not filled. They're more of just like a squishy firm silicone. And those are inserted through an incision um, in the gluteal cleft, which is kind of what we call the butt crack. And uh, it's really one of the hardest places to place a surgical incision. Um, it has, uh, you know, one of the higher complication rates of any cosmetic procedure, uh, not just from infections uh, in the area of the incision, but also from the implant being uh, malpositioned, uh, the implant rotating or flipping, uh, seromas. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, the statistics on that from the articles that I read when I was writing the book 
it, about 30 to 35 percent of these patients have to have a revision, which is really high. Oh, that's too much. Yeah, and 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 about 30 percent of the patients also get some sort of a seroma or infection that requires the implant to be removed. Wow, what a shame. So, uh, what about fillers or anything yes. like that? So that that one, I, I I would say is the least the least uh, be, best alternative. Uh, the best alternative are um, high volume fillers, um, particularly one that I, I think works the best, which is called Sculptra. It's a polylactic acid filler because it, it can be used in higher volumes and it actually helps your body create its own filler or its own collagen volume. Uh, so it's a polylactic acid polymer that's injected um, liquefied in sterile water but as these particles spread in the buttocks, it actually generates its own collagen production around the particles. So over a series of these filler treatments, you get uh, not just the volume, but the collagen production that actually lifts and firms the buttocks, which is a, a positive side effect of the filler too. And, I, and, but are these transient as far as one to two years, or is this? The average Sculptra, uh, filler lasts about four to five years in high volume. Um, uh, the, if you look at the studies of Sculptra, the, the majority of the results lasted three to five years, but because we're using much higher volumes in the buttocks, I think you're looking at probably four to five years. But again, these are alternatives, Dave, that uh, generally are fairly costly compared to a BBL because of the amount of filler that you have to use. Right. Um, I think eventually what we'll find in the next few years are other fillers that come out to compete in this arena that uh, come in larger sizes that are more cost effective. Uh, because a typical Sculptra B a BBL uh, to be done properly, it, it takes about twenty to $30,000 worth of product to actually create the proper uh, size change. Wow. Uh, so I, I think in the future, we'll need to have fillers that come in larger volumes for body contouring. Yeah, absolutely. So Mark, am I missing anything on, on BBLs that we should tell the audience? Um, I, I think, well, the, the, the last part of the book, which we didn't talk about, is for anyone who is interested in the procedure, the last part of the book, book walks you through um, pre and post-op expectations, like how to prepare for the surgery, all the typical things we tell patients, you know, avoid blood thinners, et cetera. And then it really gives a realistic um, picture of what happens at the first month, the second month, the third month, et cetera, just so that people understand that um, sometimes you, you, you feel worse and, and look worse before it gets better. Um, people go through this phase. So it kind of walks people through uh, the recovery process uh, so that people have a good realistic expectation of, of what they're going to feel like and what they're going to look like in the first uh, few months. Yeah, you know, you bring up a good point, Mark, because I think uh, if you don't educate patients in really understanding what the recovery is going to be like, when they're going to see their optimum results, you can actually get really disappointed depressed, angry patients, uh, especially if they spent a lot of their money on a procedure thinking that they're going to be able to go to a red carpet event in a month and look like Kim Kardashian, you really have to talk the realistic expectations before performing these procedures. And that's only fair to the patient as well as to the surgeon, because that makes both parties happy. A hundred percent. I one of there's one page in the book that talks about something called the happiness curve, and it's basically like these little happy faces, and it's like where you are before the surgery, and then how kind of unhappy most people get, and almost remorseful. Sometimes they even regret, yeah, absolutely having the procedure, and then they start. Then you start to see uh, the happiness kind of a return. So I think the visual, uh, seeing the visual of that, not just in the book, but in any pre-op appointment. I think it's important for, for all of us as surgeons to, uh, to remind people that, hey, you, you may look and feel worse uh, in the first few weeks after the surgery. You know, I have to tell you, I went through your book and I was really impressed with the layout of the book. 
I think the way you, you, you constructed your chapters uh, was really informative and you really got to the point of what patients really want to know and giving some really good information. Um, I also was impressed that the forward on your book was written by Dr. Miami. Really, I know you guys are friends, uh, but I, I, I was quite impressed. I don't think there's too many books out there that really lay it out simply, intelligently, well thought out and organized as you did in your book, Mark. Um, oh, thank you. So again, to tell the audience, tell us a little bit about the name of the book, where they can find it. A hundred percent. The book is called The Art of the Brazilian Butt Lift, and it is um, on Amazon. Uh, you can find it just in the book section. And um, it, it's, we, we, kept the, we kept the price uh, around $10 just so that people could uh, easily get it uh, as something that they could use as a reference especially if they're interested in the procedure. Um, and, and also if, they're in, if they do have questions that are not in the book, they're more than welcome to, to contact us um, if they want uh, more information or if they just wanna ask us a question. And I also do wanna uh, thank um, Dr. Miami, Dr. Michael Salazar in, in Miami for, for writing the foreword. Um, he, he has even more experience that I, than I do in this, in this procedure. Um, he's an expert in this procedure and, uh, and his, his story and his introduction is extremely valuable. And it really talks about um, something we didn't touch on, which is um, the self-confidence um, and the, 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 uh, the uh, empowerment that sure, surgery gives you, right? So, one thing that, that the BBL and most cosmetic surgeries give you is the self-confidence and the empowerment to feel good and to stand a little taller and to um, feel more self-confident uh, when you're out. I love that. So I think uh, that particular introduction is extremely powerful, and I really want to thank Dr. Miami for that. And I, I'm glad you brought those points up because that is so true. And I always say if the technology is there and you can feel better, then why not do it? Mark, tell us how, how can my audience and, and our viewers find you? Well, um, we have uh, our, our website is, is the easiest to, to find information. It's a uh, unique cosmetic surgery.com Y O U N I Q U E cosmetic surgery.com. And they, they can also call our office if they're interested. It's uh, our phone number. We're right here in Santa Monica, California, and it's 310-434-0044. I love it. And Mark, you're such a good writer. I'm really expecting a series now. <laughs> I so I, I look forward to the other upcoming books. I don't know. As, as and I'll, you, I'll write the forward on one. <laughs> as you will find, uh, as, as, you, as you write books, um, as a doctor, you find that because you have a full-time job, it takes a lot longer than you think. <laughs> oh, that's for sure. That's for sure. Mark, it was a pleasure having you on the show. <clears throat> I know you and I are going to do another podcast in the near future. <clears throat> I'm sorry, on mommy makeovers. Uh, but I thank you for your time. And I really recommend you as a surgeon. I think you're compassionate. You're an artist. And your bedside manner is impeccable. And so are your surgical skills. So thank you for taking the time to speak with me and, the, and my audience. Thank you for having me, uh, Dr. Gosland. And it was, it was my honor to be on your podcast. And as well, I deeply respect your surgical skill and uh, your bedside manner. You've always been a great colleague and I look forward to doing this again. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of Women's Health and Beyond with Dr. David Gosland. If you found this episode informative, be sure to subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to ask Dr. Goslin a question, please visit our website at www.davidgoslin.com or connect on all social media platforms at David Goslin. We'll see you next week for another episode.